So the big idea for today, for Fast 8, is if you're taking notes today, which you don't have to, you can just sit back and eat popcorn. But if you are taking notes, jot this down. Here's the big idea I'm taking from today's movie, and that is I have to choose my relationships carefully. Choose my relationships carefully. You are where you are today and who you are today because of the people who you've been in, been, who, the people that have been in your life up to this point. Okay, whether good or bad, you're who you are today and where you are today because of the people that are in your life. And some of those people uh, were by choice. You chose for them to be in your life. And, and others, we inherit people into our life. Like you didn't have any choice at all. You were kind of born into it or adopted it or whatever it is. But I want you to hear this. And this is not an exaggeration, you guys. Preachers like to exaggerate a lot, but this is not an exaggeration. One of the most important decisions you will ever make in this life is your relationship decisions. It, it, I, a lot of us do not realize how much our relationships and the people we choose to put in our inner circle uh, relational life dictate our future. Look, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's why you are who you are today. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 27 verse 19, a mirror reflects a man's face like it shows what you look like. But what he really is, is shown by the kinds of friends he chooses. So you show me your friends. Hey, I will show you your future, who they choose. So you have to make some choices in this process. And I want to help you make these, make these choices that will lead you to some life-giving relationships. So that you would create a bond. With, with, you'd have a community of people that you can call your family that trust you and love you no matter what. Let me give you four relationship choices that you need to make. And if you do these, if you do these today, you make these relationship choices, I'm telling you, this, this has the power to change your life. Your relationships, the choices of your relationships has the power to shape and to change the trajectory of your life like, like a few other decisions in your life. So write these down. First, we need to nurture. I need to nurture my important relationships. I need to nurture my important relationships. And all of us have some important relationships. Hopefully it's God. You got some God. God is an important relationship to you. And there's some people that are very, very close to you that, that, you, that are important to you. But they're, the, the condition that they're in, those relationships, either good or bad, is not because of the relationship itself. It's not inherent in the relationship. It's because have you nurtured it or not? Okay, like, like people tell me sometimes, like, oh, you know, pastor, my, my marriage is just, you know, it's, it's not what it used to be. I hear that. It's not what it used to be, pastor, my marriage. Like, it's the marriage's fault. It's not the marriage's fault. I have one guy literally tell me, pastor, you don't even know, but the fire has gone out. It's just, the fire is gone. It's been gone for a long time. Like, it's the fire's fault. You know what I'm saying? Isn't that silly? Isn't that silly? It's like, it's like, like you're, you're yelling at, at, at a fireplace for the fire going out. Stupid fire. Don't fire. That's a bad, that's a bad fire for going out. How dare that fire? When, when listen, sir, ma'am, when, if, if your fire is going out, what you, what you need is not to blame the fire. You need a log, okay? You got a log problem. You need some wood up in that relationship, okay? You need to get some wood on that fire, you need, you need to, come on now, you need to get a match and light a fire again. It's not the fire's, it's not the fire's fault. If you got a fireplace, yeah, it was funny. I'm, I, it was funny. Some of you caught it. If, if you got a fire, you know having a fire in a fireplace takes work, doesn't it? Yeah? Because you, you, you get a fire going, right? And you get all snuggled up. You get your hot chocolate and you get all comfy, right? You can't stay there long, can you? Or you, you stay there too long, that fire is going to die. You need to get out, go, go outside in the cold again. You need to dust off that log and clean it up and, and go back in there and put it just in the right spot in the fire. And, and look, you, relationships take work. And just because they take work doesn't make it a bad relationship. Oh, come on. Some of you guys are looking for, maybe Hollywood is showing you the 
here. Relationships take work. There is no perfect relationship that you don't ever have to sow anything, give anything, sacrifice anything, throw a match on because it's dying out. It's, it, that's, that's Hollywood, okay? Nurture your important relationships. Relationships take work. We need to nurture those important relationships. It might be your marriage. It might be your children that you need to start nurturing that relationship. It may be some key friends that God has placed in your life. We'll talk about that, that you need to begin to nurture those important relationships that God has given. You know why? Because number one, God, the, the enemy is after your relationships. He knows the power of those relationships, whether it's your marriage. He's after your marriage so bad so hard. He's after your your God-honoring relationships. He wants to divide and and conquer those areas of your life, okay? But also, your relationships don't ever stay. They don't don't maintain itself. None of your relationships will maintain itself. You need to nurture your important relationships. Look, if your relationships are are, are not healthy right now, wherever you're at, any of the ones that you would say are important or very, very close to you, if they're not at where they should be at right now, by and large, it's because you didn't nurture it. Now, I understand there's, there's extenuating circumstances, but all of us need to take some responsibility here in nurturing. Man, if I can get you to just, just grab hold of this, there's some important relationships that if you make this choice, if you, if you choose to like work at those relationships, nurture those relationships, man, your life will be so much, so much better. Um, First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. It says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, I need to be clear-minded and self-controlled so that I can pray. And above all, Man, I need to focus on just loving each other. Like I need, I need, to, I need to focus on loving and nurturing those relationships because love covers. Man, love covers. Like it covers a multitude. It covers a multitude of wrong, multitude of sins. Love covers. Love people. Love covers. Here's the second one, and that is, I need to restore my broken relationships. I need to restore my broken relationships, and I know this is a painful process for a lot of people. But please listen, and t- listen to me, please. The, the pain of fixing it is a lot less than the pain of leaving it broken. It is. Trust me on that, okay? The pain of fixing that and restoring that in your heart is a lot, is, it, it's less pain than the pain of, of, of just, keep, you know, keeping it there. Okay, and, and, not, and not dealing with it. Because what you don't know is how much that, that lack of restoration and healing that is not in your heart and in your life, you don't know how much that's affecting you. It's, it's probably affecting you more than you realize. It's probably affecting your current relationships more than you realize. You're, you, all of your relationships. It's, it's, it's now you're, you're, you, you have a hard time trusting people and there's bitterness or there's doubt and there's hard time trust. It, it, all these things, you need, you need to restore those broken relationships. I know it's a pain. And honestly, not all the time you're able to fix it because the other, sometimes the other people don't want to play ball, right? But the Bible even has an answer for that. The Bible says what to do in that case. When, 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 when you're trying and you want to you wanna restore in your heart, but someone else does, the Bible actually says this in Romans 12. Here's, here's what we need to do. Romans 12, verse 17, 18 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil You're not justified. Can I just tell you that right now? You are not justified for how you feel in your heart in hating your brother or your sister. Not in God's eyes. You're not justified for how you talk about them behind their back. You're not justified how you feel about them. Do not repay evil for evil if it is possible. And sometimes it's not, but as far as it depends on you now, you need to live at peace with everyone. And if you can't live at peace with them, you live at peace with your heart towards them. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about their heart towards you. Your heart towards them needs to be reconciled, settled in your heart. You know what? I'm going to forgive them. I think it's so interesting that Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer. He gave us seven different things in the Lord's Prayer. One of them, in the Lord's Prayer, was supposed to be a daily prayer, a daily choice that we make. And one of them was, you guys know it, forgive me just as I forgive them. So basically, it's, it's God, forgive me the same way in the same measure that I'm able to let others off the hook. You measure that back to me. Forgive me. For, forgive, forgive them. And, and I, I have to, you have to make this decision daily. And I have to make this. 
people will sometimes hurt me. I'm not above that. And, and sometimes the enemy will try to bring an offense or a hurt or someone trying to do something wrong or even perspective. So I have to, sometimes I even have to name them, God, I forgive them. I forgive that person. I forgive. And, and, and sometimes I even do it preemptively, like I begin the day. God, someone's going to do something stupid today, God. I know it. I know it. You know? No, maybe not that. You don't want to be pessimistic. But, but you know what, God? Before it happens, I'm going to choose right now. Before it happens, I'm going to walk in forgiveness. I'm not going to hold it against them. If someone does, when someone does, God, I'm just going to choose to forgive. <laughs> Unforgiveness is like setting yourself on fire and expecting the other person to die of smoke inhalation. It doesn't work. You're only hurting yourself with holding that poison in. You're not hurting them. You're hurting yourself. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. But they were wrong. Mm, I, I know. So does God. But they did it on purpose. I know. Does that fall into whatever grievances? Absolutely. It's not about them. It's about you. It's about your heart. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. And here's this last line. This is why it's easy, honestly. It's easy for me to choose forgiveness. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Man, because I know, I know I've been forgiven of a lot, and guess what? I know I didn't deserve it either. I did not deserve, I did not earn my forgiveness. I did not earn it, but God forgave me anyway out of his love and his grace. And because he did, and because I know that, it empowers me to let others off the hook when they don't deserve it. Forgive. Man, we need to choose, you guys, to, to maybe restore some of these broken relationships that are still affecting you today, more than you probably realize. We need to nurture some of those important relationships. And then number three, this one is important. Buckle your seatbelt, okay? We need to sever, sever any harmful, and at the very least, we need to redefine. Maybe you could write that on the side there. Redefine. Sever or redefine any harmful relationships. Now, I'm not talking about your husband or your wife. You can't go home and be like, Pastor Jason said, you, you find your bags outside, <laughs> okay? No, 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 no. I didn't say that. I did not say that, okay? But you know what I'm talking about. You all know that maybe that, that person that you've allowed into your life, you know is not good for you. They're not good for you. How do you know they're not good for you? Well, let me tell you something. Let me give you the secret. How do you know that that person is not good for me? I need to sever it or redefine my relationship with that person. Do they pull you away from God or closer to God when you're around them? Do they pull you down or they lift you up? If they pull you down, if you come away from them, you feel like, man, I feel like a little yucky. I feel like I hate people more. I feel like I don't like that person now. If you feel, if you feel like you got pulled down, that relationship needs to be redefined possibly even severed if it's, if, it's, if it's harmful and destructive. And there may be some relationships in this room that, that are right there. Maybe you got a flirtatious relationship. You shouldn't be flirting. You're a married man. You're a married woman. And, you, and this happens so much now because of social media. And I was reading about Facebook and how people are utilizing Facebook now to, to, to just have some, some what is seemingly innocent flirtation and it is just escalating into, into adultery and I was reading about this one, this one couple, a married couple. They were, they were cheating on each other. Two, two, a married couple cheating on each other on Facebook. They were having a flirtatious relationship at the same time and, and without the other person knowing about it. And, and then they, they, they decided to, like, to meet up with the, with, their, with the person they were cheating on each other with. And then they met up and they found out they were the same person. <laughs> they were cheating on each other with each other. And you know what? Guess what? They, they got so mad. They were so hurt by it. They got a divorce. This is, I, I'm telling you, do whatever you have to do. Listen, sir, it's, 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 not, it's not innocent. It will destroy you. It'll rob you of your family, your joy, your purpose. Listen, ma'am, the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. Okay, if your grass, it's because you haven't nurtured that relationship. You find someone with green grass over there, it's because they, they got a high water bill. They're watering that mug, okay? They're watering that grass. What you need to do, stop looking over the fence and start watering your grass. Nurture that relationship. 
Some of, those, some of those need to be severed, you guys. Some of them need to be just redefined, some of those harmful relationships. Proverbs chapter 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools has a lot of fun, though, man. He, I like him. He's my buddy. He's my boy, a companion of fools. Oh, but we, we always do the greatest. And he, she's, she's been my, my, I'm telling you, that fool's going to hurt you. That fool is going to, gonna, it's not helping you. That fool is going to hurt you if you don't redefine that relationship. I don't care how long you've known them. You can still love them. You just need to redefine it. You need to redefine it. A companion of fools suffers harm. You're hurting yourself. You're not helping you. You're hurting yourself. First Corinthians chapter 15, 33 says, don't be misled. Bad company, who you're around is going to corrupt the character God wants you to have. Be careful. The people that you're around, it will, it will corrupt. You don't know how strong and how powerful of a message this is, you guys, if you would just choose your relationships carefully. Here's the last one now. The first three were kind of, you know, they were a little heavy. This one's, this one's more life-giving. It's more um, happier, a happier one. Here you go. Write this one down. I need to also initiate some meaningful relationships. I need to initiate some, you know? In other words, we need to, I need to start some relationships that maybe I don't have right now. They're not in my life. And here's the thing. People, I hear, people do desire mentors. I mean, they do. They desire a mentor. They desire a friend. They desire a confidant, a companionship. They desire these things. It's just very few people are willing to do the work and take the steps to get them, take the steps needed to get towards those relationships. In fact, the Bible recognizes this, that, that our default mechanism as human beings is individualism. It's just going it alone, especially us guys. Us guys are just notorious for this, thinking that we can do it alone, thinking that we can handle it. I got this. I don't need, I don't need to share this. I don't need, no, I don't need a really even advice. You know, I'm gonna, I got a game plan. I, I can do it alone. No, you can't. No, you can't. You cannot do life alone. And if you try it, go ahead, try it if you want to try it. I'm trying to help you out from suffering that harm, but you're going to find out, and some of you have already found out, it, it's hard. And you know what? God, has, God didn't even make you that way, to, to do it alone, without any help, without any advice, without any community. I need to initiate some meaningful relationships. Hebrews 12, or 10 and 25 says, let's not give up meeting together, as, as some have developed the habit of. See, here's the problem. This is what our default is. Some of us have the habit of doing it alone. That's why it's hard. We have the habit of solving it ourselves. We have the habit of not sharing, the habit of not gathering, the habit of... We got these bad habits of individualism that's robbing us of, of the relationships that God desires us to have. I need to initiate some meaningful relationships. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and even all the more as that last day, that's why it's capitalized, as the last day is, is soon approaching. So I want to develop this final thought, this thought right here. How do I initiate the right relationships? All right? In fact, if you turn the page there on your outline, I want to give you four relationships now that you need to initiate. Every person, every, you, were, you were designed to have these four relationships. Every, every one of us needs and was designed to have these four relationships in our life. We need to initiate them. So let me say it this way. If they're not in your life, you need them in your life. Like if any of these four are not in your life, you need to get them in your life. Okay, here they are. Here's the first one, and that is I have to develop my relationship with my church. Develop my relationship with my church. Notice I said my church. You, know, you need a my church. Do you know that? You need, you need a, and I'm not saying you need, it needs to be this one. I invite you, you know, to check it out and stuff. It doesn't need to be this one, but you need a place where you say, that's my church. I belong. You need a place where you say, I belong belong. That's, that's where I belong. And just like in this movie, Fast 8, if you've seen it, man, this, it was this belonging. And by, the church is, the Bible calls the church your family. It's your spiritual family. And this is something that these, all these characters in Fast 8 had. They had belonging. They had family. They had, you, and you cannot fulfill 30, over 30 verses in the New Testament. You will not be able to fulfill if you do not have a spiritual family. If you don't have a local church that you say, that's my church, that's where I 
belong. See, the Bible makes it an assumption. When, when, the, when the authors of Paul and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all the New Testament writings, it just makes the assumption that you're going to be part of the body. You're going to belong somewhere. Ephesians 2.19 says that you are members of God's very own families. You're not attenders of a church. That's not who you are. God doesn't call you an attender. No, you're members of his family. You're part of God's church, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You belong. You belong. Now, I recognize that we have a lot of attenders that, you know, come to discovery. There's a lot of you that are attenders, that's, and that's cool. And we're actually, I think that's awesome that you guys are attending, and there's room for you to, look, I think, it's, I think you need to have some, a season and time and space where you can just come, and, and you're not asked to give anything, say anything, do anything, serve anybody, go anywhere. You just, you just come, and you just need, you know, Pastor, can I just take a breath? Can I just recover from the beating I took from life, from the beating I took from, from the religion? From the be- can, I just, can I just come and, yes, you can, absolutely. Please feel welcome to not contribute at all to this thing. But please, listen, you can't stay there. You can't stay there. See, see I mean, because if, if you don't take that next step, you'll never find the healing that God desires. Unless you step into belonging and get past your past, you'll never find a new place to belong. And you'll do it better. Look, you'll do life better if you belong. Life is so much better when you got people you belong with. Um, you'll get the best out of any relationship when you commit to that relationship. I just, I'm going to go here just for a moment, okay? I used to be in a, in a tender relationship with my wife. I used to have an attender relationship where I would I'd pick her up in my car. We'd go on a date. I'd drop her off her home. I was, we were a tender. I was attending. But, but eventually, you know, we, we got married. You know, we, 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 had, we became members, all right? And membership has its privileges. How many know what I'm talking about, amen? <laughs> membership got some privileges, it's, got, it's, it's also got some responsibilities as well. But look, I am so happy that I took our relationship to the next level because I would have, I would have, I would have never been able to, to get, reach my potential. And she would never have been able to reach her potential because in and through our love through, with each other that we are reaching our potential in Christ and in life. Your, 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 your relationship... It's, it's, it's going to be able to come back to you and repay back to you the level that you commit to it, any relationship that is. I need to develop. That's one relationship God, God desires you to develop, your relationship with your spiritual family. You need a family. You need a spiritual family. Here's a second relationship that maybe you need to initiate or develop, and that is I need to develop my relationship with godly friends. I need to develop my relationship with godly friends, people who you're going to be close to and Here's how you know if they're godly, right? Here's the opposite of that. When you're around them, they make you more godly. That's how you know that these are godly friends. When you're around them, they build you up. They don't pull you down. All right? They lift you up. They draw you in to, to Christ. They, they, they make you better. That's the godly friends that you and I need. How many know you need godly friends? Come on. We do. We need it. Every single one of us needs some godly friends who are encouraging you in the right direction. And by the way, this is the New Testament pattern of, 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 of church and life. They would meet together. The New Testament church met together for Sunday worship in like the big group, but then they had a house-to-house ministry. And that's what they called it in the book of Acts, actually. It was a house-to-house ministry. So they would gather in celebration in big groups. Some of the groups in the New Testament time were like thousands, like on Sunday mornings would gather thousands of people in the temple courts and worship Jesus. But then real life change happened in homes, in the groups, in those what we call small groups. And this is the New Testament pattern. It's the pattern of Discovery Church. We are a church of small groups. We do three seasons of groups. We start and stop them three times a year. They're actually starting today. You're blessed because they are beginning today. We're beginning a seven-week series, you guys, of our groups. I'm telling you, 70% of our church is in a group. The Bible says this in Acts 2, 44. All the believers, they didn't just go to church, but they met together constantly and shared everything with each other. They shared. 
And here's the secret. Here's the secret to the group. Let me tell you. The, the secret to your group is for it to get to this place of comfort, a comfort level where, you can, where, you're, where you're comfortable to share. Share what? The real you. The real you. Because, listen, every single one of us in here right now are wearing a mask. We got big masks on. Everyone, because you're in a big group. You're not wearing your emotions on your sleeve. You're not wearing all your problems on your face. You're not telling everybody on your row what really is going on. Look, it's, it's, and I'm not saying you should do that, but you do need to tell somebody. You do need to have some people in your life that you are, that, that you are real with and you are honest with. And honestly, the, these groups that we have, they gather for a lot of reasons. There's, we, we have what we call free market groups. Like I said, they're launching today. Let me put that up here on the screen. Season two launches today, June 4th through July 16th. It's a seven week, it's a seven week season. It's small because it's in the, in the summer. We just took a break and we'll take a break before fall season three, but find a group. In these groups, we, we have what's called a free market system where I don't care what people are gathering about. They gather for volleyball. They gather for uh, shooting range. We got a group going to the shooting range. We got a group playing board games and card games. And then, and then we, got, we got groups that are doing like curriculum, which is great. And I love the curriculum of doing Bible studies or book studies or, or different studies. And that's great. But can I be, I want to be real honest with you. That's, that's not why we do groups. Why we, and I'm going to be honest, okay, all that stuff is just a hook to get you into some great godly relationships and get to a place where you can go, hey, can I show you something? I need to let me, this is, this is what I'm really dealing with. That's the whole reason. I'm just, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just sharing with you. Look, it's great. Curriculum is great. But the whole reason we do the groups is so that you can, you can develop a comfort level with people and be honest. And which, by the way, the Fast Eight group was, they were just, they were a free market group. They were a car club. That's what it was. That was the hook for them. It was a car club, but that's not really what it was about. The cars were great, but that's not really what it was about. The cars, it was about being real with we're having community and belonging and trust and acceptance. That's what it was about. You need it. You, you need that in your life to develop some relationships with godly friends. I wrote on the bottom of your notes how to get connected there. A step-by-step guide. I mean, I would encourage you to go online, go do the app, go check out the bulletin. We have, a, we have brochures out in the lobby. Here's what I'd love for you to do. Call them, though. Call them. Like, sign, you can sign up online. They get a notification. But give them a call because you can tell a lot about somebody from a phone conversation, can't you? See, so because I'm just being honest, you, you, you may call one of the leaders, and just after a few seconds, you're going, okay, thank, 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 thank you. Okay, and that's fine. It's okay. That is totally fine. I tell, we tell the group leaders this. Hey, now not everybody's going to like you. It's okay. Some, some people will. It's okay. You're going you're gonna to attract certain people, and others are going to attract others. But then I'm telling you, you call another person, you're going to get on the phone with them, and then you're going to, after a little while, you're going to say, you know what? I think I just met someone that I want to hang out with. And I'm telling you, if you open yourself up to these, to these godly relationships, and, and I know it's uncomfortable meeting new people, get over it. Okay? You need this. I promise you need this. Get over that. Get outside of your comfort zone and meet some new people. And these will be, these will be, and you'll tell some people that are in small groups for a few seasons already, some of the best relationships in their life come from their, their small group. Get in a 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 group. You'll always say that and I always continue to say that. Get in a group. You need to develop those relationships with some godly friends. Amen, everybody? All right, you need to develop some relationships with, here's the third one, I need to develop my relationship with a team. A team, this is how we do everything around here at Discovery. We do it in teams. We don't do solo leadership. We don't do solo things. We do everything. We have over 400 people that are serving on a dream team right now. It's awesome. And and what's cool is that you not only accomplish more as a team and you're accomplishing stuff, which is great, but man, it's just so much funner. Can I say funner, more funner? It's just more funner. It's gooder. Being on a team is gooder. 
what else can I throw in here? I'm telling you, but it just is. Being on a team is just more fun. It's fun to be a part of a team, and we like to have fun in serving God and doing life together. And, but you were designed not just to do life t- together and to experience that level of community, but there is another part of your design that God created you with things to give back and to make a difference. And we were talking about this last week, but it wasn't to make a difference alone. Look, you'll never accomplish anything significant in life alone. Never, never, you'll never accomplish anything significant alone. It's going to take a team. I need to develop my relationship with with a team. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Therefore, sorry, there was a man all alone. In fact, he had neither son nor brother, the Bible says. And because that, it says there was no end to his misery. There was just no end to to his toil, Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. So he wasn't satisfied, not even with his own accomplishments, because he did it alone. And I'm telling you, don't don't go down that road. Don't live your your life alone, trying to accomplish it alone and go it alone, because you're going to end up at the end of the road with all your accomplishments, with all your money, and be miserable, because that's not what gets us satisfaction and fulfillment. God didn't wire you to get your fulfillment from accomplishment. God did not wire you to get your satisfaction and fulfillment from money. It may last for a while, but I'm telling you, if you just make some of uh, these decisions to initiate some of these important, meaningful relationships, you not only get in a group, but you get in a team, I'm telling you, it'll change your life when you start accomplishing things with others. There was no end to his, to, to his toil, yet his eyes weren't content with his wealth, because two are better than one. Why? Because they have a good return for their labor. God designed you to have that feeling, like, man, I I shouldn't do this alone. I I want to do it with other people. That's that God design. And I'm just saying, as part of your discovery journey, at some point here in this journey, get on that next steps. Take the next steps. Let us help you get connected to a team to do life with and to make an impact and make a difference with. You'll hear more about that coming up in the coming weeks. Here's the last one, and we need to develop our relationship with God. Develop my relationship with God. I want you to write that down. Write that down and then circle the word develop real quick. Just circle that word develop. That's a key word in that sentence, because that may be an area that you need to initiate today. But have you ever imagined, you guys, have you ever imagined what your life would be like if you, if you truly did? All up here, I know, I know that was the last feeling and stuff, but everyone, check out, before you check out on me, have you ever imagined what your life would be like if you truly just went all in with God? Because I've been in ministry for, for a while now, and what I've noticed about, about people is people often try God. They try God out. They, like, try him on. Like, okay, I think I'll just, I think I'll try. I think I'll give, give God a... A try and understand, understand that, that, that you're searching, and that's, that's, that's cool. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the attitude of our heart is just like, look, let me, let me just try. It's like, you're not good, that's not going to work. You're not going to get the, out of the relationship when you're just, yeah, just try that out. That's like waking up and going, you know what, today, I think I'm going to try to play for the NBA today. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to play the NBA. No, you're not. You ain't going to do that. You can't do that. Why? Because that takes, it takes a lot more, you're, gonna, you're not going to do anything that really has a big payoff unless you really pour your heart and your soul into it. Yeah. Jeremiah 29 actually tells us what it would be like if we made that decision to initiate this relationship to that degree. He says, if you look for me, this is God, if you look for me with your whole heart, like if you don't, if you don't, just, don't just try me on, don't just... Don't just give me part of your life. Don't just give me a few days of your life. Don't just put me in some of your relationships and not all of your relationships. Don't keep me out of your work. Don't keep me out of your... But if you seek me, God says, with everything, with with your whole heart, God says, man, I'll I'll show up in your life. You'll you'll find me in your marriage. You're going to find me at work. You're going to find me in the market. You're going to... You'll find me if if you give me your whole heart. I promise you, you'll find me in your life. Yeah. if we just choose to not just try God on, but give him our whole heart today. Let's bow our heads all across this worship center.